Okay. Okay, so yeah, I thought you were Muslim. That's what I. So you have not formally taken shahada. So you, you. So what do you cost? What do you identify yourself as, if anything? Um. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't take labels. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um. I. Uh, I would say that I'm a Muslim in the strictest sense of the word, as one who submits to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. But uh, um, my my primary shahada, I guess you would say, is the shahada of Isa Masi, and I'm a follower of the Messiah. And so what is what I, is what is the shahada of Isa Nasi? Mm, um, <clears throat> it's found in the book of First John. Let me uh, let me get it for you. It's there's really no uh, no hard and fast. It's just having a, a witness and a testimony. It's not a formula like I'd say the uh, Islamic shahada is for for Sunni Muslims. Um, <clears throat> but the uh, the concept and the idea is just to acknowledge that uh, Jesus is the Messiah sent by the Father, mm -hmm. and um, to and follow, do, follow do his you, his. Yeah. And do you, do you believe that Jesus is uh, God? I do not believe that Jesus is Allah. No. Okay. Um, I believe that the Father is Allah. And um, Jesus, Jesus is the prophet. Is a prophet. Prophet, Messiah, King. Yes. Okay. Many many things. Archangel. He goes by many titles in the in the bible so so john just to uh, uh, quote it for you directly and give you the reference it's first john 5 7 mm -hmm. which says and this is the testimony in arabic that would be the shahada that god has given us eternal life and this life is in his son he who has the son has life he who does not have the son of god does not have life now uh, which which version is that for, you said first john 5 7 right uh, yes. Yes. So that's very different from what I write, read in most uh, English comment, English translations. Are you... Because um... so first, for example, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. So verse okay. 7 says, for there are three that testify, the spirit and the water and the blood. And these three... I'm sorry, not verse 7. Not verse 7. Sorry, that's the Yohanin comma. That is... Uh, yeah, no. exactly. That's what I was saying. I was like, wait a minute, that's... No, uh, scroll down to verse 13, sorry. 13. No, 13. 11. 11, 11 and 12. Okay. And this is sorry. a testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Whoever has my, his son. Okay. Yeah, my eyes are getting a little, I'm getting a little older, and I didn't see the uh, verse name there. So. Now, in your email, uh, in your email or in your video, you're saying that, you know, if you use the Bible, you can, you can reach Christians and make them Muslims. Is that Absolutely. But then, but you're not a Muslim yourself. So I'm confused well, like a little bit. I'm confused a little bit here. <laughs> I'm not a Muslim as far as the, uh, the, the standard understanding of what a Muslim is. Like I said, I have not taken shahada mm -hmm. to make um, what other Muslims would consider me a Muslim. But I do consider myself one who is submitted to Allah, which is the actual literal meaning of Muslim. Yes, I, I would agree in, the, in a sense, but... The Quran says that Allah only accepts Islam. Now, now that the Prophet has come, Allah only accepts Islam. So if you were a follower of the previous prophets, you have to accept Muhammad and follow him and obey his teachings. So that means not, like just, not just taking the Shahada, but also living as a Muslim, praying five times a day, fasting in Ramadan, you know, all those things that Islam requires, making the yeah. pilgrimage. So from that definition, you're not technically a Muslim. Even if no. you're taking the shahada, you're not, you're not a Muslim in the sense that you're a follower of Muhammad. No, because I believe in one God and one law, mm -hmm. and that the God doesn't change and that his law doesn't change. And therefore, I see that... Um, that's, know, actually, were, that's actually not true even in the Bible. Uh, if you look in, uh, I believe it's in the, in the book of Numbers, there was a law of inheritance that had to be changed because situations arose where... Uh, there was a, there were some uh, women. There were daughters of a man. He had no sons, right? So the original law was only sons could inherit lands. So the law had to be that law was abrogated, and then the new law was that yes, these are women. They can they can inherit from their father. Can you show me that law in the Torah where it yeah, I'm says? Yeah, I'm gonna look at for you. I don't remember the exact reference, but I know it's. In, I want the um, I want the reference to the original yeah. law that uh, only sons could inherit. Yeah. One second. While I'm looking that up, 
So that's what we're talking about in terms of you know laws and Sharia. So for example, yes, previous nations had their Sharia, Sharias, right? Yes. But then with Islam, Islam is universal religion. It it uh, overrules and abrogates the previous laws. Now we have Islam. Now we have the Islamic Sharia. That's the Sharia that everyone should follow. I agree that there's something things that changed. I mean, obviously there were no cars, no um, no speed limits things like that. There are some things like that that, you know, change, but the principles are the same and unchanging. And so I do sure. not believe there are any... Yeah, I mean, for example, like, adul like that that adultery, adultery is forbidden. It's always forbidden. It's not like it was allowed one right. time and now it's not. Idolatry is forbidden, right? Those things are always the same. But the intricacies of the law can change. For example, in the Jewish law, a menstruating women cannot even touch you know, the same furniture as her husband. If her husband sits on it, he's impure. In Islam, the universal law, that is no longer applied. Yes, when a woman is menstruating, she cannot pray, she cannot, you know, read the Quran. Uh, she can't touch the Quran. She can recite the Quran, but she can't touch it. And she can be, you know, she can be touching her husband. It's not a big deal. They can, they can kiss at least. They can't have sexual intercourse, but they can at least do, you know, like simple touching. That's not a big deal. That doesn't make a man impure. In the, in the Islamic Sharia, it, it did in the, according to the current Bible, it did make a woman impure, or a man impure for several days or something. Again, he had to undergo rituals to, so that those are the kinds of laws that were or changed. That was for specifically the children of Israel. All right, I'm looking this up here. Um, da, 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 da. So it is in the Book of Numbers. Um, I'm very familiar with the story. Okay, so it's at Numbers 25. Oh, no, sorry, no, not number 25. Uh, what happened here? Number 27. Mm -hmm. So the, the daughters of uh, Zelophehad, who had no sons, so there, there were f uh, five daughters. And it says in verse two, and they stood before Moses and before Eliezer the priest and before the chiefs and all the congregation at the entrance of the tent of the meeting saying, our father died in the wilderness. He was not among the company of those who gathered themselves together against the Lord and the company of Korah, but died for his own sin and he had no son. So why should the name of our father be taken away from his clan? Because he had no son. Give to us a possession among our father's, bro our father's brothers. So the original law was there was no, no son, uh, only sons could inherit, right? Well, or the, un or the uncles. That's what I'm asking for. I'm not asking for the reference of the story of the daughters inheriting. I'm asking for the reference of the original law. Well, they're referring to the original law right here. Um, and, then, and, then, and then verse 5, it says, Moses brought the kids before the Lord, and the Lord said to Moses, the daughters of Zelophehad had a right. You shall give them possession of inheritance uh, among their father's brothers and transfer the inheritance of their father to them. And you shall speak Sorry, to them. Where so, did they quote the original the, law? Well, they're making their case. Why should that our land be give, not be given to us? I, I understand that. But how do we know that they're talking about a previous law versus a tradition versus a custom, culture? How do we know what they're talking about here? They're going to Moses and saying that. Yes, I understand that that's what they're doing. But I asked for the reference of the original law. Because in order to claim that it's been changed, I would like you to give me a reference that says, Thus saith the Lord, Yahweh, that only first sons could inherit. And I don't believe that law is anywhere in the Torah, which means it wasn't changed. What they're addressing here is a, simply a tradition, which I do agree, traditions and customs can change. But when God says, this is my law, and he speaks it with his own mouth, I do not believe that that changes. And that's the difference between me and Muslims today, is many believe that when God speaks something directly with his own mouth, that he can come back and change that. While I agree that he can, I do not believe that he does. Let's see if I can find that. Okay, so in the law of, in Deuteronomy only says the sons will inherit. So Deuteronomy 21. Deuteronomy 21. 15, yes. Good, yeah. good. That's what I was asking for. Um, <clears throat> yes, can you uh, read where it says that only the sons inherit? Well, it doesn't mention, it doesn't mention daughters, it just has sons. Okay, let's see. But it, where does it say that only sons can inherit? 
It doesn't have to. It, it only says, it literally says when he gives his inheritance to his sons. It doesn't say sons and daughters or sons or daughters. It doesn't exclude daughters. Why wouldn't they mention it? Like in the Quran, it mentions, you know, if a, a person has sons and daughters, the son gets certain portions, the daughter gets certain portions. Like it's been, it's been spelled out clearly. Yeah, so I think it's very clear here. This is actually not addressing who can and cannot inherit. The verse that we're talking about here, Deuteronomy 15, is simply addressing if the, if the man has two wives and uh -huh. which, which, which eldest son, the son of the one wife or the eldest son of the other wife inherits. It has nothing to do with um, excluding daughters from inheritance. And so this is actually, this Deuteronomy comes after Numbers. True. And so the only mention that you're able to provide for me of some kind of original law that you're claiming has changed comes after the first story. And it doesn't even say only sons can inherit. It never says only sons can inherit. So I think what we're dealing with here, we're not dealing with a law where God says, thus saith Yahweh, do this. We're dealing with a tradition and a custom. And this is what these women were. Yeah, but, 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 but why would they be but, a custom? Why would they be such a custom? When you have the prophet of God right there, and he's given, he's been given these laws, why are they following a custom that clearly would not, if you're, if, according to your interpretation, does not exclude daughters from inheritance? I mean, it's really literally in well, the time of Moses. We have, to, we have to remember that all prophets deal with customs from before the time that the prophet came. No, I, I get that, but if this custom was being followed, wouldn't it have already have been dealt with and said, "Look, yes, daughters can also inherit." Why did it have to? The situation have to arise, and people didn't even know that. You can actually inherit. You can, the daughters can actually inherit. They have to go to Moses and, and present their case. And then God said, yeah, they're right. Now you can do this. Then shouldn't we ask ourselves, why didn't the people of Muhammad's time also already know that the God was one? I mean, how many prophets had come before them to tell them that God that's, was one? That's, no, so this is, now you're talking about theology. But we're talking about inheritance laws here. And inheritance, and then, by the way, inheritance laws in, in pre-Islamic... You're saying... Hold on, hold on, hold on. Pre-Islamic, pre-Islamic, pre-Islamic Arabs, mm -hmm. daughters couldn't get anything. Women couldn't, couldn't inherit anything. So Islam came, the Quran revealed this law that if you have daughters, you have sons, they each get a portion. Yes, the, double, the sons get double the portion because they have to, they're responsible for their families. So they get double, but daughters also inherit. So that law, that was specifically clarified, right? It, it, they didn't wait for a situation to arise where, you know, some daughters who, have only had, who had a father who had no sons, they had to bring their case to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and say, well, what about us? You know, this was already dealt with. The law was revealed. Which is why Muhammad is pointing us back to the Torah because it has the answers there. No, it's not saying in the Quran that the, you're following the Torah laws, no. Because again, the Torah law is only for the Jews. It was only for the Israelites, the children of Israel, but in Israel. It was not a universal law. Actually, that's, 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 what, that's what that's what Muslims believe. The Shari Islamic Sharia is universal. <laughs> I know, which is why I don't consider myself a Muslim like a Sunni Muslim, because I believe that some of their traditions are wrong and some of their teachings are wrong and not according to the scriptures and not according to the Quran. It is absolutely according to the Quran. Uh, maybe not according to the Bible, that's, but that's different because the, the Quran, uh, we, don't, we don't believe in the Bible. Like, we don't believe 100% the Bible is the word of God. And, and not even Christians and Jews believe that. They believe that certain people wrote the Bible with their hands. They may believe that maybe God inspired or something, but uh, no, nobody really literally says that, the, you know, the Gospel of Matthew was written by God or sent by, down by God. It was written by a man. If you ask be, them, no Muslim would actually believe that the Quran was written by God either. The, the Quran is the word of God, literally the word of God. The, 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 can, the, the uncreated. Of God as well, but each, in each case. But, but it's not, though. The, but it's not, though. But it's not, though. Even, in, in, the, it, even in the New Testament, for example, it says, this is the epistle of so-and-so to so-and-so. Like, this is not the word of God. This is a, a man claiming to be writing a letter. I didn't say, I didn't say every word in the Bible was the word of God. It's very clear when it's the word of God and when it's not. But even the words of God were written with a human hand for both the Quran and the Bible. The only thing that actually wasn't written with the hand of man was the Ten Commandments that are recorded in the Bible. Those were written with the finger of God. God there, did not there, there, are two, there are two versions of the Ten Commandments in the Bible, by the, by the way. If you look closely, there are two, two versions. Um, but yes, I would agree. Allah revealed the Torah to Moses. Allah was the author of the Torah originally, right? He, that, that was his, his literal words, his scripture. 
Moses didn't write it. Musa did not write it. Somebody else later on did not write it. By right, I mean they didn't like sit down and, and start writing a book. You know, like okay, maybe 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 they didn't come up with it because because God gave it to them, but they most certainly did write it with their hands. They wrote no, down no. the words. Yes, I, I understand they wrote it down with their hands, but I'm, I'm talking about like an author. Like I wrote a book, for example. I've written two books mm -hmm. uh, that are available online. I sat down and I started writing from from scratch, right? I I did not dictate this book from somebody else. You see what I'm saying? So the Allah sent down the revelation, yes, and they were written down by human hands. But the author was not a human. And but that's the case yeah. with the Bible. Many books of the Bible, we mm. clearly it's clearly no, no, no. that's the case with shows. parts of the Bible. That's the case with parts of the Bible. Okay, so parts like, of the Bible are firsthand eyewitness accounts of things that the prophets did. So that you have I don't think um, they're first. I don't think they're firsthand eyewitness accounts. There's no proof for okay. that. That's your opinion. That's fine, um, but it doesn't matter. I, we're talking about what's in the Bible. We're talking about the fact that there are words of God in the Bible, such as what there give, are. Give me an example. Commentary in the, like the letters of Paul are commentary. They're commentary on the Torah and the Injil. Well, well give me an example um, of like what you would consider to be the word of God, literally the word of God that was just copied the, down by a person. Well, let's. Um, these were words that were actually written with his finger. How about that? Shall we go to that? Okay. So Exodus 20. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Exodus 20, 13. You shall not murder. This is one of the Ten 20, Commandments. Is that 20, written with the of God. Yes, Exodus 20, verse 13. Okay. It says you shall not murder. You shall not murder. Okay. So this was, this was literally the word of God, right? Literally the word of God. You see when it's speaking here, it says uh, 20, verse 1, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, da, 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 and then go down to verse 13, you shall not murder. Mm -hmm. So you shall not murder. Have these words been changed? Uh, probably not. I don't know. Probably not. Well, if yeah. they were changed, would they have been changed from? Let me just look something up here real quick. There's only two options here. No, 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 no. I, I accept that this is a this is a, a legitimate teaching. Of course, God said you not you, you shall not murder. But what right, he meant right. was you, you can only you cannot murder for somebody for no reason, right? It has to be, for no, example. Right. For a criminal who is guilty of a capital crime, you can kill them. Right. We're not talking about killing. We're talking about murder. Yeah. Right. I agree with you. So I, I, agree, that, I agree that that's a, teach, a legitimate teaching that came from God. Are the yes. exact words the way God revealed it? Probably. Maybe 99%. Probably. Maybe. I don't Probably. know. I, I, don't know who, I, don't know. I don't know the presentation. Maybe these words are not the way he revealed it. So if these words are not quite the way he revealed it, the only op other option would be the opposite. In this case, mm -hmm. so the only other option here would be that God actually said, "Not you shall not murder, but no, no, you no, shall no. murder." No, no, no. You're not understanding what I'm saying. I'm saying yes. God revealed you shall not kill unjustly. You shall not murder people. I agree with yeah. that teaching. I accept that that okay. came, that it it came from God. Excellent. I had the okay. same teaching. Like like we Muslims okay. believe that what's whatever's in the Bible that agrees with the Quran, we accept it because obviously Good. if you it agrees with us. Agree. That we these words it. are authentic words of God that have been preserved. No, no. So hold on. Let me. For, let me. You understand? Four thousand. You not understanding me? Four thousand years. I agree that that is a legitimate teaching of God. Was it revealed specifically in this order? Honor your father and mother. You should not murder. You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. You know, I may probably. I don't know. Oh, so I, you, I cannot. You just... I cannot say, hundred percent that exactly the Bible as it is. Is exactly how God revealed it. Okay, so we're just going to say that maybe the order of these commands. So the next line here, you shall not commit adultery. You're saying that possibly that that was before and that the original way God said it was you shall not commit adultery. And then he said, you shall not murder. I, I don't know. I'm just speculating. I'm not saying anything. Who I'm cares? Not making, I'm not making anything. Who cares? Well, no, about no it makes a difference because if the Bible Why? has been, if the, if the word of God has been edited by humans, which it clearly has been, and there are, that there are issues with that. Right. Let's, see, let's think for, about this. For if example, oh, oh, let me, let me, it would have been let me, edited from Let else. me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. Like, for example, we believe that the, as the Quran was being revealed, 
right? Mm-hmm. People, the Muslims just didn't, didn't just put them in specific any order they wanted to. They they had a specific they had instructions from the Prophet sallam. When this ayat was revealed, you put it here. You put it in this surah, or you put it in this order, right? It was all determined from the beginning. That doesn't ex- affect the message of the of the text. I agree, it's not a big deal. But I'm just saying I cannot say 100 percent that as the text is in Exodus 20, for example. That's exactly how God revealed it. It's definitely, it's probably teaching you of God. Say that for the Quran either. What you're, what you're going off of is belief and faith. In I, the Quran. I agree. I agree. I you're agree. not willing to extend I agree that with that. the Bible. And so you're, you're saying that the order could be changed. Who cares? What's the difference? Well, we're talking about here. Well, what it's, really it's, matters it's more complicated is, than that, obviously. I'm just giving you an example. No, it's here. Not more yes, it is. No. Yes, it is. Dude. You shall Look. not murder. The only other option there is that that originally God said you shall murder, and that's not the case. God would never no, command no, no, people no. to murder. These words are not changed. They're not I, altered. I'm saying maybe, yeah, maybe it is. Maybe it ha- they had not been altered. Maybe, sure. Maybe I, I have no maybe. problem. Are you I, saying that God originally said you shall murder? No, that's you, the only you, other you're option mis- here. You're misquoting me. You're misquoting me. No, I'm saying on. you said maybe, and I'm asking you, what are you saying? I'm saying I cannot say for sure as the words have reached us. This is exactly how God revealed it. Maybe the words are different. Maybe uh, the order is different. I don't know who wrote this. Who wrote this down? The wor- words are different. So maybe God never addressed the concept of murder is what you're saying? Maybe maybe, what, maybe he said, is, maybe, hold, not, on, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Eat, maybe you shall not eat hamburgers? Maybe, maybe he maybe said, maybe he said, work? hold on. Maybe he said you should not kill people unjustly unless in the order of some, some other version. That's what I'm saying. Does that make a difference in this case? No, not, not, a big, not a big difference. But I'm saying I cannot say for sure that this is exactly the word of God. I agree with it. I agree with the teaching. I had no problem with it. There. You weren't there when it was recorded. You're going off of faith for the Quran just as much as you're not going off of faith for the Bible. So I no, think no, we're not. No, no, we're not. Because we have this in, particular in, conversation over. In the Quran, I don't see any reason why we should continue this can particular I, can, I, can I finish, please? In the, with the Quran, we have unbroken chains going back to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That this is how it was revealed. It was revealed in, in, in 10 Qarat, right? Se- uh, seven Aruf. We know that. We have unbroken chains going back. You don't have the same thing with the Bible. You don't have unbroken chains so going you're, back you're, to Prophet Moses. You're trusting, men. you're trusting men. That's what you're doing. You're trusting men. Sure. Why not? And we have other evidence. The Quran, <laughs> can the Bible be memorized? Have you memorized the Bible? Word for word? Yes, People, the Bible. Children, memor- children memorize the Quran word for word. So you're telling me that we can't trust? Oh, we, we certainly can trust it because we have unbroken chains. People have memorized you know, the Quran word for word. Who's memorized not the one entire person, Torah? Not one, not, one Torah. Person, not one person in history has memorized the entire Bible word for word. Even right. the Torah. Let's just say the Torah. The five books of the Bible. Oh, yes, they have. Oh, they yes, have they have. Not, I've never seen every, one person. Every Jewish boy before they reach the age of 12. No, for that's not true. Hundred thousands of years memorize every single word of the torah the torah was distributed mm, no. very widely That's around the Roman empire oh absolutely i would absolutely. I, I would i would challenge you to provide one example of a person who's memorized the, the torah word for word like muslims mm-hmm. do muslim children muslim children as young as five memorize yeah. the quran word for word all right so you know what you know what it is not a conversation i really want to get into because okay no problem I don't need to debate with you on it because, let's let's talk about Muhammad himself held the copy of the torah in his hands and he issued a judgment from the Torah. He read from the Torah. He had the Torah read from him. He treated it respectfully, put it on a pillowcase. No, no, that, that, hadith, that, hadith, is, that hadith is weak. That hadith is weak. That hadith is weak. That hadith is weak. You're calling Bukhari. That hadith is Bukhari weak. You're calling it's not Bukhari. Bukhari. It's not Bukhari. It was Abu Dawood. Well, it certainly is. You can go check another video out on my channel, Remnant Rendezvous on YouTube. You're where misquoting I, it's not Bukhari. It was Abu Dawood. It was Abu Dawood. Bukhari, from Bukhari, that Muhammad had the Torah in his hands. He authenticated it. No, you're, confused. Said you're, you confusing. To you're confusing two hadiths. I, I, I understand what no, you're talking about. No, that hadith sorry. is weak. Go check my channel but, out But, but, but let's, let's end that conversation. Let's go We're to your... I know your Absolutely. channel. I know your let's channel. Let's change the topic. Let's go That's to your it. specific argument that you made about the book of Daniel and uh, the false prophecies in the book of Daniel. Yeah, yeah. The challenge that I, I gave you. Yes. Let's, yeah. uh, let's definitely talk about that. Okay. So I actually... If, I don't know if you're aware. I actually wrote a book on Daniel. On the book of Daniel. Mm-hmm. It's called uh, Visions in Exile, a critical analysis of the book of Daniel. It's on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And so that my my video was specifically in response to um, that guy, uh, Finlandi, the the blasphemer, uh, Finlandi, 
Um, so that's that's that was specifically. I, I wasn't giving a whole, you know, talk about the entire book of Daniel. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I actually now believe that Daniel two possibly contains an authentic prophecy about the coming of Islam. Islam was the kingdom of God, and we can get into that. But I want to address your specific arguments about Daniel eleven. You said that it was talking about Antiochus the third, and not Antiochus the fourth. Yeah, Daniel 11 never gets to Antiochus IV. Antiochus III, as the last Greek Seleucid king that Daniel 11 actually refers to, the Antiochus IV was an invented uh, interpretation done by apostate Christianity in order to deflect away from the idea that apostate Christianity was the beast, was the Dajjal, the final deceiver. Um, That is, obviously, we all know that the Dajjal is apostate Christianity, um, and so, so where I, do you where do you think really, where, where do you believe the, the ch- in the chapter where does it stop? Like Antiochus the fourth is not there. Antiochus the third is the last one. Where does that stop? Third. So there's there's a pattern when you read the uh, Daniel eleven, mm-hmm. and we start with the Persian kings uh-huh. in the first couple of verses. Yep. And as soon as they have a conflict with the next king of the north it's all kind of a successive we're talking about kings of the north here Um, as soon as they have a conflict with the next empire suddenly it ends there so the only three kings of persia mentioned the Mm -hmm. third king of persia had a major conflict with greece now the persian empire did not end then however the book of daniel in chapter 11 stops talking about persia at that point and it shifts focus now to greece Uh and so verse four i believe starts talking about a mighty king, Alexander the Great, mm-hmm. and the Greek Empire, okay? Yep. And so we go from verse um, 4 with the Greek Empire splitting up into north and south. You have the Seleucids in the north, the Ptolemies in the south. Mm-hmm. This is very standard. I mean, the, the prophecy is so specific. It's, it's absolutely amazing um, how well, it was fulfilled. Well, I don't think it's a prophecy. I think it's a prophecy that was written after the fact, but go ahead. Yeah, a lot of scholars hold that opinion, but that's, yeah. God can do amazing things. Um, so anyway, when, when, when Antiochus III fights with Rome and is defeated, even though the Seleucid Empire does continue for a time because Rome defeated Antiochus III, it really, the Bible stops, the book of Daniel stops talking about the Greek kings and now talks about the Roman king. Okay, so it, it, whenever someone is defeated, even though their empire drags on and lingers on for a while with their sons, it really stops talking about them and switches to the next empire. Okay, so that's the pattern. That's why. What is the next empire? It ends with I. Uh, for example, Darius was um let's see here that's persia that's persia i'll I'll read the first couple of verses and uh, and explain exactly what i'm talking about here so first few verses daniel 11 yeah and also in the first year darius mead i even i stood up to confirm and strengthen him and now i tell you the truth behold three more kings will arise in persia okay so these are uh, the first three kings after Cyrus and after Darius. Um, so you have Cambyses, and then you have Darius, and then you mm-hmm. have Xerxes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now it says here the fourth, which would be Xerxes, uh, shall be far richer than them all, and by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. Okay. Now we know that Xerxes was not able to conquer Greece. Okay. He was defeated by Greece by the Spartans and others. Right. Mm -hmm. so then in verse three it doesn't talk about persia anymore even though we know that the persian empire continued you have the whole story of the book of esther with king ahasuerus in the bible okay nehemiah ezra you know we know the persian empire continued for many years but verse three then switches and it says then a mighty king shall arise it's talking about greece now alexander the great who shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will and when he is arisen his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven we know that Alexander did not have sons. His kingdom was divided up into four kingdoms, okay? And two of those kingdoms were the Seleucids in the north, the Ptolemies in the south. The Ptolemies in Egypt, the Seleucids in what is now Turkey, mm-hmm. okay? So even though, even though 
the Persian Empire continued, it switched to Greece because Greece defeated Persia. Okay, so when you get down to verse 17, which is talking about Antiochus III, there's so much in there that indicates it's Antiochus III and was mm -hmm. fulfilled. I, I agree. Third. You can go, all the details are there on my channel if you haven't watched it yet. I, I agree. Up, up to this point, I agree with you. I, I, again, I've done the research. I have a book okay. on this. So at that point, it says in verse 18, he shall turn his face to the coastlands. This is Antiochus III's attack on the Aegean, okay, mm -hmm. to yep. disarm the Aegean, and shall take many. But a ruler shall bring the reproach against him to an end, and with the reproach removed, he shall turn back to him. Um, all right, this translation says a ruler, others say commander, okay, yep. mm -hmm. referring, I believe, to um, Scipio, it's the yeah. Roman general Scipio. Scipio Asiaticus, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so then the transition then is no longer, it does not continue with the Greek kings anymore. It transitions to Rome. All right. And Rome gives way to papal Rome, gives way to the beast, the Dajjal. Okay. And so what a lot of evangelical Christianity does is try and take the focus off of Rome. And so they continue this prophecy down to the Greek kings when we as people who read the Quran and the Bible need to look at this and go, no, this is talking about the Dajjal. This is talking about Rome. This is not a false prophecy. It's the interpretation that is bad, which is the, the point of the video that I made giving you a challenge there because you threw out the entire book of Daniel based on a bad interpretation of the prophecy. The prophecy itself is not wrong. I can go down here to verse 29 and 30 and show you how this Ver these, this one verse has so many very specific keys that were only fulfilled in one historical event. The prophecy is not wrong. The interpretation is wrong. And so you're, I really appreciate what you're doing. You're going against these evangelical Christians who are out there, you know, distracting us from Rome being the Dajjal and the beast. That's good. But you're throwing out the book of Daniel, which can give us guidance and additional details on that beast. Okay. See, see my point? Yeah, I see your point. So up to basically worse 18 and 19, I, I agree 100% with you, with the interpretation was about Antiochus III. But what I, the problem is, I think your interpretation is completely mistaken. Because, right, so verse 19, it says that he shall turn his face towards the fortresses of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and shall not be found. That's Antiochus III, right? He died uh, roughly 187 BCE. But then continues, let's, now let's look, then shall arise in his place, in his place, Antiochus III's place. So that's the next king in the line. That was Seleucus IV. All right? And it says, he shall send an exactor of tribute to the glory, for the glory of his kingdom. This is referring to Seleucus sending a tax collector to the Jewish temple. All right? But within a few okay. days, he shall be broken in either in anger nor in battle. Uh, then in his place shall arise. So it's continuing. It's telling you there are more kings coming. So okay. you, in his place shall arise. Uh, hold, hold on, let me, you, went, you went on for a long time. Let me just let me just go with this. So number, verse twenty one: In his place shall arise a contemptible person, to whom royal majesty has not been given. This is Antiochus the fourth, right? He 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 became the king. Well, your interpretation: You'd be down to Antiochus the fifth or whoever was after Antiochus the fourth now, because you're talking about in his place. And let me just let me continue. All right. So Antiochus the fourth becomes the king. Army shall be swept early. In verse twenty. Right, 21, yeah. And, and so 21 is about Antiochus IV's the successor. No, no, no. It's still Antiochus IV. In his place well, shall arise a contemptible person. In his place. And in verse 21, it says in his place. Yeah, verse 20. We're talking is about hold in on, the place of the previous and then in the place of the previous. Yes, correct. So talking about two successive different people here. Yes, that's true. Verse, as I said, verse 20 is about Seleucus IV. Seleucus <coughs> mean the fourth. Antiochus IV. No, Seleucus IV. Seleucus IV. Seleucus IV was inherited from Antiochus the third yes there there are kings take the names of previous kings so he was Seleucus the first there were there were previous previous to three other Seleucuses Seleucus the first second third this is Seleucus the fourth his full name was Seleucus the fourth Philopater all right that was he was the king after Antiochus the third then after him was Antiochus the fourth so yes Antiochus the third Seleucus the fourth then Antiochus the fourth Okay, that was the order. So it continues the Antiochus IV. He's the one who's, who's sending the armies, verse 22. Uh, when an alliance is made, he will act deceitfully. Uh, and then it mentions the contemporary person again in verse 25. That's the same king, Antiochus IV. 
He shall stir up his power and his heart against the king of the south, which is Egypt, with a great army. Right? So he attacked Egypt in 170. Uh, he captured some cities, Pelusium, for example. This was the sixth Syrian war. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, then it says in verse 28, he shall return to his land with great wealth, and his heart shall be set against the Holy Covenant. The Holy Covenant is the Jews, right? The, the, the temple and everything. And he started attacking Jerusalem. And we know this is still talking about Antiochus because verse 29, it says that the time appointed for he shall return and come into the south, which is again Egypt. But it shall not be this time as it was before. For ships of Kittim. What is Kittim? What are ships of Kittim? Um, go for it. You tell me. The Romans. Because we know this because in the, uh, it, it could refer to the Greeks also. It was used in, for the Greeks. But in the Dead Sea Scrolls, Ketin refers to the Romans. And we no. know this happened. We, we know, yes, it does. We know this happened <laughs> because when Antiochus IV attacked... No, no. You, you, went no. On, Ketin, you went on for a long time. I didn't Cipriot. interrupt you. I didn't Cipriot. interrupt you. I didn't interrupt you. You keep interrupting me. Let, me. let me go on. Okay, so this is referring to when Antiochus attacked Egypt again. Okay, but this time, this was 168 BCE, when he attacked, the Romans intervened. This is historical fact. The Romans intervened and basically humiliated him and forced him to withdraw. This is what it's referring to. For ships of Kittin will come against him, and he shall be afraid and withdraw. There was a Roman senator, a Roman uh, uh, ambassador. He literally drew a line in the, on, on the ground and gave him an ultimatum to Antiochus. Like, if you cross this line, you're done. We're going to destroy you. Fourth. Antiochus. And, no, Antiochus the fourth. Antiochus the fourth. You, 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 have to look at the you have to look at the history. The yeah, history look at is the very, history. very crystal clear. Antiochus III is already done. That was verse 18 and 19. That was when he attacked Greece. We agreed on that. Yeah, Roman, and Rome put him in his proper place and correct. drew a line around. Right. No, that was Antiochus IV. You're, you're confusing the situation. Antiochus III was defeated in, by Scipio, right? Then mm -hmm. Antiochus IV attacked Egypt, the south. And who was drew the line around him? I forgot his name, but it was a Roman senator, I believe, uh, who, who basically gave him an ultimatum, and he was forced to withdraw. Okay. So this is referring to Antiochus IV. It was IV the Treaty of Apamea. Okay. It was a tr you're talking about the Treaty of Apamea with mm -hmm. Papilius Linnaeus. Okay. Yeah, that's probably Demand him, yeah. Antiochus III. Okay. Antiochus III was the one that had the circle drawn around him by Papilius Linnaeus. At the Treaty of Apamea in 188, the year before Antiochus III died. So he was defeated on. by Commander Scipio. He was defeated by Scipio Asiaticus in 189. The next year, he was forced to sign a treaty, and Papilius Linnaeus drew the circle around him. So none. He died the next year. Okay, hold on one second. Okay, what year you said that was? 188. Treaty of Apamea, A P A M E A. And what was the name of the, of the ambassador? Popilius Laenus. P O P Popilius Laenus. I U S L A E N A S. Yeah, Gaius Popilius. Uh... Yes. Yeah, no, that, I don't know where you're getting this from, but. Uh... Gaius Papilius Laenus uh, was the one who gave the ult ultimatum to Antiochus IV. This was in 168 BCE. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Rome drew a circle around the Greek kings. Therefore, the successor is no longer the Greek kings. It's Rome. Okay. What, you're what, is, your, what is your source on this? Hmm? What is your source on this? A source? Yeah. Like a reference. Uh, let's see. We should be able to just pull it up straight in Wikipedia. Well, I, first, of all, I, first of all, I don't trust Wikipedia, but it's fine. You can go ahead. All right. Go to Britannica then. Yeah. But I'm looking at Britannica. So Gaius Papilius Laenus in Sacramento Britannica states that he was the Roman ambassador who presented Antiochus the ultimatum to evacuate Egypt and Cyprus, not Greece, Egypt and Cyprus. And this was in 168 BCE. 
I'm sure that there were probably multiple times when Rome did that, but I believe the first time was with Antiochus the third. Wait, so there was a, there was the same ambassador each time, both times. I'm talking about twenty years difference. Could have been, but I don't see any source that says it was Antiochus the third that was presented with the oh. ultimatum. Treaty of Apamea, mm -hmm. eighty-eight BC. Okay. That's um, this a was year a, this, before. This was a peace treaty. Yes, it was a peace treaty where Antiochus III was forced to pay an indemnity. This is Britannica. He was forced to pay an indemnity of fifteen thousand talents mm -hmm. because he went to war in the Aegean and lost. Okay. Okay. Yep. And <clears throat> so that's that's fulfilling what it says here. Um, after this, he shall, in verse 18, after this, he shall turn his face to the coastlands and shall take many, but a ruler shall come, shall bring the reproach against him to an end, but the reproach moved and should turn back on him. Correct. Or does it say A? I agree. That's verse 18. I'm talking about verse 20. Yeah. 20, uh, verse 29 and 30. That's different. Oh, yes. No, I agree. Verse 29 and 30 is way after that. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's not Antiochus the third. That's Antiochus the fourth. I disagree. Who, who is because, it? Because you're, you're taking your sources from Christian evangelicals who have it out for Islam. Unless you have some evidence or counterinterpretation, you can't just say, well, you can't trust them. I'm, okay. tell, I'm showing you the evidence. There are, four, there are four keys in verse 29 that you're talking about. Okay. Mm -hmm. It says, at the appointed time, uh -huh. the Hebrew word there is moed. It's a very specific time. Uh -huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's not just any time. It's at a very specific time. Okay. Yeah, I agree. He shall return and go toward the south. Okay, yeah. So we got a geographic clue here. Mm -hmm. It shall not be like the form of the latter for ships from Cyprus. Okay. The Hebrew, it's actually not a Hebrew word. It's actually a word that comes from Egyptian. For ships, it means uh, it's seam. Okay. It's an oared war galley. And mm -hmm. Cyprus is an English translation of the word Kitim. Okay. Yeah. So it's theme. theme from Kitim. So there's four keys. You have the Moed, you have the south, which is Negev in Hebrew. You have the uh, Tazim, which is a specific kind of warship, and mm -hmm. Kitim. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now we know from archaeological reference and historical reference, Josephus, others, Kitim, as well as, as well as Egyptian references, Kitim is Cyprus. There's no, no debate on that. Um, so these have to be ships that come from Cyprus. They have to be a very specific kind of ship. The Tzim ship has to be a ship that is an oared war galley. Okay, these dominated warfare in the Mediterranean for quite some time. Okay, it has to be, they have to come from the south. So that means that they're going north from Cyprus. These ships are going north from Cyprus to wherever this battle is that's talked about in verse 29 and 30. And that this particular battle has to happen on a Moed. All right, now this is the real key here. Because in Leviticus 23, it describes seven moed throughout the year, okay? It's Passover, which you have a beginning and a final day of Passover, so that's two. You have um, Shavuot, or Pentecost, in the book of Acts, that's three. Then in the fall, you have um, the day of trumpets. You have Yom Kippur, or Asherah. And then you have a beginning and ending date of Sukkot, okay? Mm -hmm. There's only one battle that I'm aware of in all of history that was fought on one of these seven dates. And that is the Battle of Lepanto in 1571, October 7th, 1571. And it was fought with war galleys, Ottoman war galleys that had come from the south, from the island of Cyprus. They, in fact, had just conquered the island. The Ottomans had just conquered the island of Cyprus from the Venetians. Okay, so there are multiple ways to interpret this prophecy. And what my challenge video was pointing out to you is you can't throw out the book of Daniel based on some evangelicals interpretation of the book of Daniel. This is not an other this interpretation not, this is not, out there. This, this is not an evangelical interpretation. This is based on the evidence. This is based on the evidence. I just told you in succession. Yeah, you're, you're getting this evangelical is, Christian. Getting it from evangelical Christians who have talked about this. It doesn't from, matter who I get it from. It's based on the evidence. Again, I told you. It's in succession, Antiochus III, so the IV, Antiochus IV. You've, you've thrown out the book of Daniel. Okay, so we've thrown out this interpretation. 
You cannot throw out the prophecy based on an interpretation because there could be a different interpretation, which is what I was trying to point out to you. As long as there's a different interpretation out there that is true, you can't throw out the prophecy. But you haven't okay, proven so it was I true. I agree with you. I agree with you. Right now, what you're doing is you're defending the interpretation of an evangelical Christian. And you already said that it's bad. And I agree with wait, you. Wait, you okay? broke up. You, you broke can't up throughout the book of Daniel. The you broke up. Not, the hold on, hold on, not hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You broke up there. I didn't get what you said. You're, you're throwing out... You're throwing out the book of Daniel, the prophecy of Daniel. Mm -hmm. And right now you're defending an evangelical Christian interpretation mm -hmm. of the book of Daniel. Okay. Now, can okay. I respond? Can I exactly respond? What I tell you, like, you can't, if that interpretation is wrong, it doesn't mean that the prophecy of Daniel is wrong. It means the interpretation is wrong. Can I, can I respond now? Okay. So first of all, you're assuming that this is a prophecy of Daniel. I have no reason to assume that, okay? Second of all, there is internal evidence from the text that he is talking about whoever this author was, he was talking about specific events in the second century BCE. And I showed you the succession. So that interpretation is valid, completely valid. Not so if it's wrong, you already pointed out that it's wrong. It's wrong because the author got it wrong, yeah. No, the yeah. author didn't get it. Because yeah, there's a different interpretation. That's my point. The book of Daniel is not can, wrong. You can you're, make you're, up you're any. You can make up any. A prophet, you're calling a prophet of God a, a liar, a stagger of the law. Okay, first of all, you're what making you a doing? you're making a straw man argument. You're I don't believe. Astray, excuse man. me. Excuse me. Do not tell me what I should and should not believe. And you're making a straw man. You're making a you're making a straw you're making a straw man you're making a straw man argument. I, no, have no reason, I have no reason to believe Daniel was a I prophet have, of God, and you're throwing him out. First, again, I don't share your beliefs. I don't believe this was spoken by Prophet Daniel. I believe this was written by somebody in, in the second that's century. Choice. That's second your choice. Century. That's my choice, yes. And yeah. it's based on facts. It's not based on blind faith. It's not based on facts. Yes, it is. On, yes, no. it is. Based on a bad interpretation, you're throwing out the book of Daniel based on a bad interpretation. By I'm, throwing out, I'm throwing out the book of Daniel based on evidence. There's no <laughs> evidence. Okay, let me. I have like five more minutes to go. So let me just continue here. So verse 30 is referring to the Roman intervention that forced Antiochus IV to uh, uh, withdraw in humiliation. Okay. Then verse 30 uh, says, forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress. This exactly happened with Antiochus IV. After his humiliation in Egypt, he started attacking the temple. He, he desecrated the temple. He installed in a pagan idol, an altar. This is all historical fact. It happened. Okay? So that's where it ends. And then it says it ends with his death. Look, I'm not... The king, not the king fell to... And by I'm the way, let me, let me just show... Let, let me just... Let, one more thing. Let me just uh, also respond to your claim that this is about Dajjal. Okay? So, the, the, so do, you, do you think that verse 40 and afterwards is referring to the Dajjal? Absolutely. Okay, so let me show you why that's wrong. Because in the Hadith, it says that Jal will conquer basically the entire world. One, except, one thing except, I would like, one thing I, I would like to I, clarify can you please, first. Can you please stop to clarify interrupting first. me? You said, you know, about historical facts. And I agree with you. I'm not disputing historical facts, okay? Uh -huh. What I'm disputing is saying that those particular historical facts are what this prophecy is talking about. Because okay. obviously this prophecy is not talking about the emperors of China. It's not right. talking about the people in Chile, and it's not talking about Antiochus IV. Okay, so thank you. Okay, fine. So you're saying at the end, at time of the end, this is verse 40, the king of the south shall attack him. Who is the king of the south? Egypt. Egypt. And who is the king of the north? Is that the Dajjal? It would just be the Dajjal. The Dajjal, okay. So, but the, the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and with many ships. He shall come into countries and shall overflow and pass through. He shall come into the glorious land. And tens of thousands will fall. Here's where this falls apart. It cannot be referring to the Dajjal because in the Hadith it says Dajjal will conquer basically every city he walks into, except for Mecca and Medina, the two cities. Everything else will fall. But verse 41 here says, and tens of thousands will fall, but these shall be delivered out of his hand. Edom and Moab and the main parts of the Ammonites. Somehow Edom, which is, I believe, Jordan, or is Moab Jordan? Uh, actually, actually, Jordan is both. Edom, okay. Moab. So, so for some reason, for some reason, Jordan will escape 
the mm -hmm. wrath of the Dajjal. This is contradicts the Hadith. The Hadith say that he will conquer every city except Mecca like and Medina. Medina. How can, how can, how, yes, it does. How can Edom and Moab and main part of the Ammonites escape from the Dajjal? What, what was so special about them? Because Mecca is in Petra. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Okay, we're done here. We have to continue this conversation some other time. All right. Sounds Mecca, fine. Mecca is Petra. Oh, my goodness. Very <sighs> much significant archaeological evidence that for is, that. That time. is such a bogus, ridiculous, revisionist nonsense. I, I, I've... I, Good. Uh, I've stood in mosques <laughs> here in Jordan that are pointing uh, to Petra. I've stood no, in. No, they're not. This, this was this I've was stood, this was refuted by. I've stood in my head mosques. This was refuted. This was refuted by David, David King. He refuted this nonsense. David, look up David King. He wrote a very detailed article about this. He refuted this nonsense. This is revisionist nonsense by a Christian missionary, by the way. So that's ironic that you you accuse me of listening to evangelical Christians and you're using this, this bogus argument. No, that no serious scholar. I'm not using the argument. I have been to mosques, Umayyad mosques here that were built in, um, let's see, they were built about 790. I, I know the argument. I know the argument. I've heard and this before. These mosques point to Petra. This has been refuted been by, da look up David King, please. Look up David King and he will I set you straight. Need to see someone else's data. Okay, I've seen we have to go. We have to go. So, okay? I have to go. I live here, I live here in Jordan. I've that's been that's here. that's fantastic, but you're you're still wrong. So, <laughs> all right, uh, I, I we should have another conversation though. Uh, definitely continue this conversation. Sure. But, sure. Free to do what you want with the recording. I'm not gonna. Well, we'll see. Maybe I'll I'll post it. Because I, I originally I thought you were a Muslim. That's why I didn't want to like create like a division. I, I, am, a, I am a Muslim because I submit to God. I am not a Sunni. But you're I'm not, not you're a not, Muhammadan. You're, you're, you're not a Muslim. You're not a Muslim in the sense of Islam. I acknowledge all the prophets, and I believe. Well, you don't because because okay because you don't Anything follow. Else? If you acknowledge other, the prophet, if you acknowledge the prophet, and requirements. Muhammad, if you acknowledge the prophet Muhammad, so Muhammad, you would follow his teachings. You don't Look, do that. the Quran says not to break yourself up into sex. Okay, so like we That's, like we start yeah, don't email, break yourself uh, don't break yourself into sex among Muslims. Yes, each other among the mu'min, right? The mu'minin. But you're not a Muslim. I I, I misunderstood. I thought you were a genuine like Sunni Muslim. So you're not a Sunni Muslim. No, no, no. No, I never claimed to be a Sunni Muslim, no. Uh, your email made that. If you were, if you should know for oh. a fact, if you were making that claim, Assalamu alaikum and, you know, la ilaha illallah and all these other things, I would assume you are a, a Muslim, a Sunni Muslim. Oh, you can assume I'm a Sunni Muslim, but there's a you lot should, of other Muslims. You should know better than that, than, okay. to, than, to, make, than to make me think that you are a brother in faith and you're not. I didn't make you think anything, okay? You should, you should, I'm saying you should know better. I have this a was, channel out there, Minute Rendezvous. You can go check out my channel. You can be very clear on my channel exactly what I believe. Everything is out there. I'm Torah observant. I believe in the Messiah. Okay, Torah observant, believe in the Messiah, and I believe in submitting to La ilaha illallah, the one true God. If so, that was, if that was the case, you would submit to you would become a Muslim, and a Muslim as in the follower of Muhammad, follow the Sharia, but you don't I follow do that. All, including Muhammad. And I believe he was a result. So that's fine. That's that's yeah, good. That's a good, that's, the, that's a good start. But there's more to that than that. But we'll continue this uh, some other time. Your opinion. We'll continue this another time. All right. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum salam.